as automobiles became even more widespread by the middle of the 20th century, uh, freeways began to make their mark on Issaquah. In 1940, Highway 10 came through and with it the first bridge over Lake Washington. And what this meant was that people could live in Issaquah and work in Seattle and use the bridge to travel quickly between the two communities. Highway 10 also served to split the valley in half, which meant it divided a lot of the dairy farms and that provided a hardship for uh, some of the dairy farmers who now had to figure out how to get their cows from a pasture on one side of the freeway to a pasture on the other side of the freeway. There was no freeway, there was no freeway. Highway 10 uh, ran through the city and there was a uh, stoplight <laughs> on the highway. And we had a four-way stop, a blinker light at uh, Front and Sunset. And those were about the only, those were the only lights in town. Before the floating bridge, you had to go down around the lake and uh, through Renton and then through what was later Rainier Valley. And so it was, it was about an hour trip. I was living up there about, uh, about a mile out of Issaquah, right at the intersection where they go down to uh, West Lake Sammamish Parkway. And we had a little stream there the, below the hill. And uh, we lived there for uh, 20 years. Then the highway official says, you've got to move out of here. And we protested and went to court, but it didn't do any good. We just saw surveyors out in the field one day. That's when uh, they first put in Highway 10, which is now Gilman Boulevard. And they were out there, and they just said under eminent domain, and I didn't even know what it was. In fact, my dad knew, but he never had paid any attention to it. And they just said, you know, we're going to put a highway through. It's coming from Seattle. And that's the first we knew of it. The state came through and condemned some land uh, through the Pickerings as Bob Pickering related, I think, in the newspaper recently about how it took their property, and it took some property along the Bergsma property there. When the engineers were in the field, we talked to them, and they said there'd be somebody out to talk to us about it. And one day a car came in, and so a couple of guys got out and said they were going to build a highway through the valley. And we said, what do you mean, right, right through our farm? They said, yes. And they said, uh, this is the price we're going to give you. And they give us a card with a thing on I asked, I told the guy, I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for even making us this offer. This is horrible. He says, well, see you in court. Everybody along the corridor there did lose some property. It did not impact us uh, so much like uh, Elvin Barlow, who had the farm as you just come into the valley, and they, they had to build, uh, uh, I won't say bridges, but they had a under, uh, under the highway tunnel for the cows to go from one side of the highway to the other to pasture. So we ended up in court. We had to get a lawyer and go through all this stuff to see if we could get more money for putting in the old Highway 10. And during the court session, we tried to get them to go down 56 from the, from the east side of the hill, come all the way down 56 and go around by the gravel pit, but they said, no, we're going through the middle. And uh, it's ironic that even today, I've talked to different engineers that were at court with us, against us for the state, said that's really where, this, where the road should have went instead of cutting the valley in two. But we ended up losing in court, got no overpass, no underpasses, and we could cross the highway, but we had to stand there in the middle of the road and hold the traffic back while we crossed with cattle and had a heck of a time. It took 40 some acres off of our farm. That's when farming really through the whole valley, the Bottle Farm, Farm, Berksville Farm, our farm, all of them, the taxes went up so high with the land with that highway going through and the, and the taxes and, and the fact that we couldn't cross from one side of the road to the other, uh, farming was done. Highway 10 created uh, opportunity for roadside attractions. So this is when Bones Chocolates was established. 
We had little businesses like Burt's Hamburger Stand that were established to take advantage of the traffic going from Seattle to points east. There were also a number of small roadside motels that were established along I-10. Um, I-10 today is Gilman Boulevard. In the early 1970s, Interstate 90 was established, and that increased a lot of the changes that Highway 10 had brought about. The biggest change, I think, that came to Issaquah was uh, I-90. That was one of the biggest things, anyway. That changed the town. You know, parts of Gilman Boulevard are part of the old Highway 10. And in those days, we could turn left easily onto Highway 10, cross the traffic, and go into Seattle. You didn't need a stoplight in many places. So that had a major change because what it did was it split the town in two, in the north side and the south side of I-90, and it provided access to the town like it had never been provided before. It was in 1969, I believe, the road was either constructed or we were still talking to the state about what it was going to look like. And I can remember the uh, District 1 administrator coming out to a city council meeting and telling everybody what the new I-90 was going to look like. And everybody was concerned because they thought that it would bypass Issaquah. Nobody would come here. The state was very difficult for the families that lived here in town where they took property. Their primary contention was that the property would be worth more after they took it and built the freeway than it was before they ever did it. So we lost 11 acres of ground, but we took the state to court and we won. The Pickerings, I think, lost close to 50, 60 acres of ground, and they lost in court. So that the state came through here and bought most of the property 10 cents on the dollar. And it was a horrible travesty for these families. They wound up uh, uh, with their property all split up into various smaller parcels, not knowing what to do with it, couldn't farm it anymore. There was no good access between back and forth between the north side and the south side. So they sold or lost portions of their property to the state that I remember very, very well. It was really sad to watch.